Hey everyone, welcome to Bama Bug Fest on the web, a virtual event dedicated to the fascinating world of insects. Uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web is a collaborative event brought to you by UA Museums, the Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Uh, we are offering nine total days of bug themed content that started on July 7th and will be ending this Saturday. I can't believe it already. Um, July 25th um, and uh, for a full schedule of events you know please always make sure to check out our website bamabugfest.org um, today we are talking about I'm gonna say it and I'm probably gonna trip up on it again because there's a lot of alliteration but summer senses sight sounds and smells is our day today and um, we are about to jump into a segment with Dr. John Friel, director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Um, and he's going to do a segment called The Hills Are Alive with the Sounds of Insects. Um, how's it going, Dr. Friel? Good. It's going really good, Allie. Yeah, good. So we've seen you a lot on this program, and we are um, always excited to have another uh, lesson from you because I have a feeling, it's just a guess on my end, that insect memes are a part of it and I'm really excited about them. There will be a, a fraction of today's program that will uh, share some memes. Yes, definitely. Excellent. Um, and remember, if you are watching with us now um, or even watching with us later, watching this one later, please go ahead and pop into the comments any questions that you have for Dr. Friel. Um, we will be able to ask him questions live. Um, but if you aren't able to watch this while we're filming this right now, still go ahead and put your comments in. We do collect them throughout the day and we'll answer them during our daily wrap up, which I believe Dr. Frill will be back for. So um, make sure to any questions that you have or comments that you have, pop them into your wherever you're watching it, your comment section, and we will be able to get to them. All right, so I think we'll just get it started. What do you think, Dr. Friel? Does that sound good? Ready to go? Do you want to go ahead great. and pull my presentation? Yes, I'm going to get rid of this for you. Um, all right. Here we go. I'm going to pop out. OK, thanks, Allie. So as Allie said, today's theme, I'm going to be focusing on a little bit about how insects produce sounds. Uh, we've, I've talked a lot about bugs in general, including other arthropods, but today I'm really going to focus on insects because of all the arthropod groups, they're probably the ones that we as humans are most uh, aware of producing sounds. And at this time of year in Alabama, if you go, it doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime, if you go outside, you are going to hear insects. And they, depending on uh, where you go during the day, it's mostly cicadas. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about cicadas and how they produce sounds. And at night, um, it's, it's primarily the katydids and crickets and their relatives. So those are two groups which I guarantee you've heard if you've been outdoors in Alabama this summer. So the first thing I want to do is maybe talk about some less common sounds. Uh, insects can produce sounds in many ways. Uh, the most common, common one, obviously, is going to be buzzing. Um, mosquitoes buzz, flies buzz, bees buzz. And these sounds as you might suspect, are created by the animal's wings. Uh, but, and as they move them, they produce vibrations, some of which are audible. Um, most people know the sound of an irritating fly buzzing in your ear, a mosquito. It's, it's unmistakable. Um, and while most of these sounds probably don't have a function, in at least one group of insects, uh, bumblebees and solitary bees, they actually do serve a really important function. This buzzing sound is actually used to pollinate plants. And this is something that you'll appreciate. Um, so I got there two memes already, Allie. Uh, I'm into one. I really like the one with the dog, Allie. I think you will like that one in particular uh, because you kind of like joke puns. And this is, what do you call bees buzzing in unison? They're a sting along. And then the other one, obviously, uh, I, even though I love bugs and insects, I also often uh, get annoyed by the mosquito or fly that's buzzing around in your ear and just driving you nuts when you're trying to focus on something. That dog one is great. It's so good. <laughs> So I mentioned about buzz pollination. So this is something um, you probably haven't realized that they do this. I don't, I don't know if Megan Pimsler mentioned any time she was speaking about this with um, bumblebees, but bumblebees and other solitary bees, if you have tomato plants, they do something um, that's called buzz pollination. They actually will land on the flower, and then that buzzing sound, that not only can you hear it, but it also shakes the pollen loose. And they use this to get to the pollen they couldn't otherwise reach. So it's this really interesting mechanism. So if you're growing tomato plants, you might go out in your garden and take a look at the pollinators. And if you do have a bumblebee or a solitary bee come along, watch it carefully. You'll see it'll land on the flower, and then it, it'll actively buzz. 
and basically it's almost like you shaking an apple tree or something. You're knocking off, in this case, pollen. It falls down on, on the body of the bee, and it can take it to uh, the next plant where it will come in contact with the male parts of the plant, the anthers, uh, excuse me, the, the female part, the uh, stigma, where the pollen can then fertilize the flower. So it's really interesting, and it's kind of a neat idea where they've taken this sound producing mechanism and actually used it uh, as part of their pollinating behavior. So I, I think that's really neat, and because it, they do it not only for tomatoes, but other plants that are related, other solanaceous plants as well. So it's a kind of really neat kind of side fact I like to throw in there when we're talking about um, insect sounds. Tapping sounds are another th way that insects can produce them, much like you can tap your fingers on a desk or... Um, insects can do the same thing with their body parts. And while typically we don't hear this because typically the tapping sounds are quite uh, much lower amplitude, uh, they are used widely. Um, I mentioned a lot of grasshoppers can tap their feet. Uh, cockroaches can tip their abdomens. Certain beetles bang their heads against substrate. Um, so it, it actually occurs a lot. We just don't hear it. It tends to be at a level that we don't hear. But um, and some insects, for example, they actually communicate through plants and stems. Uh, a lot of tree hoppers tr um, and leaf hoppers do this, where they produce vibrations that can actually transmit, and they can kind of use a Morse code to communicate with uh, other members of their species. And through a little meme on there, some people probably have heard tapping sounds. Sometimes you might have heard a little moth that's attracted to the light through your window. So that's another example of a tapping sound. Something that is kind of unusual, but I like to put it in there because insects do do this, they can actually produce sounds by ejecting air, in some cases even fluid from their bodies. So uh, last year, if you came to our uh, regular Bam Bug Fest, we had live insects and we had um, several examples of hiss hissing cockroaches. And if you've ever handled a hissing cockroach, you may have heard or seen them actually produce this distinctive hissing sound where they basically squeeze air out to their spiracles. This is their breathing apparatus and that produces a hissing sound an example of a fluid would be things like bombardier beetles which uh, as a defense can actually eject this con a cocktail of fluids that when they come together actually vaporizes um, almost like steam it's actually it, it's chemically can burn you and actually is hot enough to burn you and that generates a sound as well so kind of an unusual case uh, where beetles can produce this. So while it's not particularly common, it's, it is a sound mechanism either by uh, expelling air or fluids that animals or insects can make sounds. And just my little joker meme down there, you know, people are often really intrigued by the general hissing cockroaches, which are quite large. I mean, we actually had tractor pull races with little miniature tractors last year at Bugfest, but you show them a very tiny uh, cockroach and they completely lose their mind. I thought that was kind of an interesting meme that really does reflect my own experiences seeing how people respond to cockroaches. But the two things I want to talk about in most today are probably the most common examples of sound production. And the most common one are stridulation sounds. And stridulation just means rubbing two things together. Think about taking your fingernail and rubbing it against the tooth of a comb, uh, producing a sound. This is a really common mechanism in many animals, particularly arthropods and especially in insects. And it's how grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids, these are all orthopter insects, as well as some beetles, and even some spiders produce sounds this way. So, and then depending on the group of um, insects you're looking at, or arthropods, they do it in different ways. Uh, they may rub, for example, two special parts of their wings together, which is probably how most of the sounds you're familiar with that I'll show you in a bit are produced, or they might rub their hind wings against their wings, or even their mouth parts. There are some beetles that can make noises by rubbing their mouth parts together. And below you are some of the more common insects that produce stridulating sounds. There's a picture there at the bottom of a field cricket, a tree cricket, and then a katydid. And these are the kind of very typical summer sounds. These animals are abundant in the summers. Their sounds are, are of, amp of a large enough amplitude that you can hear them, and they are in large numbers. So when you go outside at night, you will hear a chorus of these insects is producing primarily stridulation sounds. So let's look at a little more details. Here I've got a nice uh, picture from a website I'm going to be talking about in a bit called uh, songsofinsects.com, but it shows you what's at the base of it. So I mentioned a stridulating structure involves two surfaces. And here if we look at the very base of the forewing, of a katydid, you'll see one of the surfaces is ridged much like a comb. We call it a file. Again, it looks kind of like a file as well. 
And then the other surface is the scraper. And you imagine if you take that scraper and you move it, drag it across that file, you can produce sounds. And the wings of these um, katydids act to amplify that sound. So you can imagine this being your fingernail in a comb, and if you had some mechanism for amplifying that, you get to produce these large stridulation sounds. And it's this very simple mechanism that typically we don't see because it's relatively small, somewhat hidden by the insect's wings themselves, but they can produce a very, really large uh, amplitude sounds that you can hear from a distance. So this happens in crickets and katydids. The sounds, the stridulation sounds are produced with the base of the forewings, just like I showed you in the previous slide. And then the rest of the wing actually kind of works like an amplifier to amplify those sounds. So they transmit greater distances through the air. And in the case of grasshoppers, they actually make the sounds not so much by rubbing their wings together, but they actually will rub their hind leg against their own wings. Uh, and then two very appropriate means, uh, crickets. Uh, crickets often have this reputation to hear cricket sounds when people think there's awkward silences. That's a really common time you'll hear a cricket sound used uh, in movies or in television. Um, and then, of course, if you've ever had a cricket and you're trying to go to sleep and you want it to be absolutely quiet, that little chirping cricket, um, and this says kind of funny because the, the insect they actually show there is an immature cricket. Its wing buds are not fully developed. So actually, this is one where um, the entomologist side of me recognizes they probably should have used an adult cricket in the meme. But nonetheless, I think it was a funny meme. And the other one there, you know, is actually not even a cricket. It's a, a Katie did. But again, gets to this point of not cricket sounds being used for silence. So there are some small details that you're wrong in both memes, but nonetheless, I thought they would be memes that uh, I know Ali Sorley would enjoy, and hopefully some of our viewers. And then the other kind of sound we hear a lot about are what cicadas do, and they have a really special sound-producing mechanism called a timbal. And a timbal is only found in male cicadas. They are these two special rib membranes that occur on each side of the abdomen, and they're typically hidden by the wing. In the middle photo, you might be able to see um, there's a little, it's kind of small in this, but it's blown up. This little window that's kind of right behind the wings on the abdomen. There's one on each side. And this little timbal has muscles that insert on it called tim, timnal muscles. And when the muscles are flexed or muscles contract, they flex that surface and it clicks. It clicks when it goes in and it clicks when it pops back out. And together they, click, they produce this very distinctive sound. They do it repeatedly at very high speed. And then there are air sacs, much like the crickets and katydids were using their wing membranes to amplify the sounds. Crickets use an internal air chamber as an amplifier. Think, think about the inside of a drum or of a uh, guitar uh, that can basically take the sounds and amplify them so they 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 travel a much greater distance. This is what the cricket, the uh, excuse me, the cicadas' bodies do. And what's amazing about with this structure, these crickets can produce amazingly large sounds. Actually the loudest insect sounds of any insects are cicadas. And there are some cicada species which can produce sounds well over 100 decibels. And this gets into the range of sound which can actually be damaging to your ears. So it's really incredibly deafening. And I bet if I walked right outside my office here on the UA campus right now, I could hear some of these sounds of cicadas up in the trees producing these incredibly loud sounds. And again, the males are doing this to produce Actually, the producing sounds to attract females. Uh, they emerge from the ground. Uh, most of what you're hearing right now are, are annual summer cicadas or annual cicadas. Uh, it's not the periodic ones, which we'll have in a few more years. But uh, nonetheless, we get them every single year. They're multiple species, and it's just the males using this special timnal structure uh, that they, they basically move in and out, produces this clicking sound, and then in mass, it produces the sound we typically think of as cicadas. And again, the two little memes here, one talking about a cicada playing a song. And some people think it sounds like a buzz. Other people think it's more like a shrieking scream, which is the kind of what the other meme is is, is pointing to. Oh, what a lovely summer's day. <clears throat> scream. That's the John, I have to talk to you about the one on the left with that cicada and the guitar. You know how much I just... I, that's the perfect meme. I think that that might have out memed all the other memes. I think <laughs> that's my favorite one. And I thought that that wouldn't happen, but I think it did. Yeah, so I'm glad, I, Ali. I'm glad you you you. Now that I know you like the memes as much as I do, and hopefully others do. I think they're. I think memes are a great way to sometimes engage people about rather complex. If I just started, if I didn't have any pictures and just talked about 
the anatomy of the cicada's uh, timbal, I think a lot of people will get bored very quickly, even myself. But I think you throw in some memes there, kind of a context for it, some humor. It suddenly becomes a really interesting topic that hopefully uh, people that are watching this will bring up at their next dinner conversation or tell their friends, maybe tweet something about it to friends, that they learn something about a timbal sound because uh, and- that's a word that probably wasn't in your vocabulary before today. And when you do that, use hashtag Bama Bugfest. Yeah, please do. You can win some stickers. I'll plug that again at the end. And just to put it in context, that sound. So I mentioned it's well over 100 decibels. So here's a uh, sound of decibels. And decibels are kind of a, it's on a logarithmic scale. So every time you go up, it really doubles. And it, it, it's kind of the energy that it transmits. But we're basically in the sound range for some cicadas getting above a, a a train on a train platform, what it might sound like, approaching the sounds you might hear at a, as a, at a, at a music concert. So, and t- potentially you could actually, if you were really close to one of these cicadas and you couldn't move away, you could actually damage your hearing. I mean, that's the kind of energy that these animals are capable of putting out. And again, you don't have to worry. If you go outside, they're not at that level that you're hearing them. They're at a much lower decibel level, but nonetheless, they are incredibly loud summer sounds. And again, it, uh, I think a lot of people think about them, you know, the first freeze we have, all these um, animals will be gone and it'd be really quiet at night. So I think a lot of people uh, are nostalgic about those summer sounds. And again, you can thank the cicadas primarily during the day and the crickets and katydids at night. So for the remainder of the talk, I kind of want to shift to a website that I've been focusing on. I've used some of their images, uh, some of their, and some of their, and now I'm going to use some of their sounds. So I'm going to take you now to the songs of the insects website. So Ali and I are going to switch out to my web browser here. So I got to leave this, leave this, my screen, and then put it back in. Let's see here. Let me choose. This, I. I mean, we all know that cicadas are loud, but I guess I never realized how loud they could get. It's, you know, like if you were stuck in a room of cicadas and you could potentially damage your hearing. That's fascinating. I think there's going to be some movie where they're used to torture somebody because I think it's that <laughs> loud. Um, no. And I've been in places, you know, the other I've been in places outside where frog song is something I've talked about uh, mm-hmm. other times. You know, the summer, it's really loud outside. When you go outside in the yeah. winter, it's kind of quiet. But come spring and summer, um, insects in particular and some other groups of animals, uh, there are other you know, frogs I mentioned, but there are other animals at night, owls. Um, it's amazing the cacophony of sounds you'll hear out there. I, I actually heard for the first time raccoons. I never think about raccoons yeah. producing sounds. But when I was out at night listening to some insects, I noticed there were some eyes in the trees. And I have an oak tree behind me. I had four raccoons that were, I had startled that were at my, my bird feeder. They went up in the tree and I could see their eyes shine and I could hear them. And I'd never heard raccoons communicating before, but they obviously were making these really distinctive sounds to one another. Uh, so again, I, as a biologist, I'm still learning new things. So I encourage you to go outside and just listen. And you'll definitely hear insects, but you might hear some other creatures. I heard an armadillo uh, that it wasn't uh, uh, yeah. out running around for grubs. And, uh, you know, I never know. Sometimes I hear owls, uh, coyote mm-hmm. we hear a lot. Um, Summer's a great time to be outside, you know, besides the, the fireworks and things like that, there are a lot of really cool night sounds that you can learn that, a lot of. That summer symphony. Yep. yep. So, Ali, if you, there's this the screen here. I just wanted to play you. I'd, check this out. There's, there's more information I can go to, but they've got some great videos, some great sounds, some great pictures. I use some of their images in my talk here, so I would definitely want to plug it. Um, here's a video, for example. So I mentioned crickets. Here is a type of tree cricket. And this one in the video, you can actually see it moving its wings. So you get some visual. So if you could actually see one of these insects, this is what it would look like and what it would sound like. So that's in real time. So you can see it's moving its forewings and it, it has that file and uh, rasp at the base of its wing that is rubbing together. And then the clear part of its wings is that you see most of is actually what's resonating. So that little that little that little thing is probably maybe an inch and a half long that insect, and it's producing those sounds. So I find that really amazing uh, that these little sounds can make little insects can make such big sounds. And you can actually, if you're careful, you can get that close at night with a flashlight. If you walk in your backyard, I always go out at night with a flashlight looking through my garden for spiders, and sometimes I'll come across little tiny tree crickets like this making calls, or even bigger katydids making their their sounds. So let's look at some of their other, um, you can get into a whole, there's a whole vocabulary for cricket sound. So I like this. They've got these little buttons you can click on the same website, a different tab, 
Um, so this is the chirp. This is the quintessential sound of a cricket. I think most people would recognize that, that as cricket. Um, other types of sounds, uh, sometimes longer things are called trills. So this is a pure toned uh, chicken, uh, cricket trill. There's lisps. It's a little more like that tree cricket. It's a little bit longer, drawn out note. Um, a zit, a soft staccato sound. Yeah, that's a Katie did sound. I, I hear that a lot at night. A tsip, which is a brief fuzzy note made by many Katie dids. It's a, it's a little more complicated. And then you have a lispy trill. I love the names, the vocabulary. This is what I hear a lot of. This, 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 this is what my backyard sounds like at night, only like 10 times louder. And then rattles, where you basically get lots of long series of these strung together. And again, you know, the hard thing is usually when you go outside at night, it, there's multiple species and multiple individuals. So it, it's sometimes overwhelming. It, it's, sometimes it's a little bit hard to pick out individual insect sounds. But, um, you know, often you're, if you're closer to one, it'll sound louder. Sometimes you can actually localize where the insect is. But often it's just kind of like 360 surround sound in all directions. There are insects typically above you, but sometimes they're at, you know, your level, but typically they're up in the trees at night, occasionally on the branches or trunks of trees as well. And then sometimes particularly field crickets and are on the ground. So the other thing I want to show in this slide is this song interactive. Um, so it'll take a second to load here, but I'll just play a few of these uh, to give you some idea of the variety of sounds. So let's look at this tree cricket here. So I love this sound because they also have a little a sonogram showing you the the sound profile if you're able to, to map the frequencies. So the, the, the thicker the band, the higher the, the frequency is. So that was just a tree cricket. Um, here's a shot, a short-winged um, meadow Katie did. So what I find fascinating is you can sometimes you get really good at this. You can identify the species and much like people do with bird sounds, you can learn and there are people that can identify insects by ear. So I find that really fascinating. You can develop, uh, here's another Katie did a different species. We have very similar species here that I've heard making these kinds of sounds. And again, it's making the sound simply by rubbing that specialized structure at the base of its forewings. Um, I love, this is a really funny looking one. We have the same types of Katie dids. They're called cone heads because they have a cone shaped head, kind of a faster pitch, with a little pause between the different notes. But hopefully I, I just want you to get a sense for how different some of these can sound. And then something that's going to be really different, they only have the one cicada here, but we do have swamp cicadas here uh, in Alabama. I get in my backyard in Tuscaloosa here. Um, and again, this is not producing it through stridulation. This has that special timbal or organ. And often it kind of starts and then it kind of ramps up. And that's just one individual. And again, in a single tree may have dozens of individuals. Um, and again, um, that's a really typical sound. As I mentioned, you know, in general, I mean, both cicadas and katydids, crickets and um, tree cr uh, cr crickets can make sounds both day and night. But in general, nine times out of 10, the sounds you're hearing during the day are going to be the cicadas. And then at night, it's going to be kind of swap out. It's going to be more the katydids, tree crickets and crickets. So it's a great website. If you have any interest, definitely check it out. They actually have a whole um, identification guide um, where you can go through individual species. And again, this one I think is, the person that did this I think is based out of New York. So we don't have all the same species, but there are many cases species that are the same or at least very close. So you can go through there and just, you know, be blown away by the diversity of sounds. Um, and again, it's another way that you can engage in particularly, you know, for someone that's visually impaired, I imagine, you know, going outside and realizing um, how much you can learn about whether it's bird song, but here's a whole other group you may not have thought about. Um, and I know as, you know, as I get older, my vision's not as great. I get more attuned to acoustics and uh, I realize it's a whole world to be discovered uh, for me and for most people. 
and we uh, shared that uh, website on the con in the comment section of where everyone's watching. So if you want to take a look at it, go ahead and click on that link. But if you want to see it again, just in case, I'll put it up here. Um, it's a great, it's a great, I was just kind of um, thumbing through it a little bit. It's a great website. Yeah, this individual, I, I, I think he actually may be somewhere where I used to live. I used to live in New York before I came here. Um, but looking at him, I mean, he's a good photographer and he takes excellent sound recordings. And I think it's just his passion. He has a separate Vimeo site um, that has a lot of bird songs as well. So I think he's just someone who is really engaged by natural sounds. Um, some people are really into natural soundscapes. And insects are, are definitely part of that soundscape. So I definitely encourage people, you know, it, it's probably something that I think for most people take for granted. Um, so hopefully, you know, with a little bit of knowledge, you'll think about insect sounds. A little different. They're not always annoying sounds that darn <laughs> cricket, I can't get to sleep or I can't hear myself think because of the cicadas that are, you know, busying my backyard. And it's kind of funny. A lot of us have been doing Zoom meetings um, sometimes with some of the members participating outdoors. And I hear bird sounds, but I also hear insect sounds. And mm -hmm. I like to sometimes point out to people, hey, listen to the swamp cicada in the background. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I, you know, I think we talked about earlier today at the 10 o'clock one where we did some insect smells, but we talked about how smells are such a powerful memory trigger, but I think sounds are the same way, you know, I mean, just, just listening to the things that you said personally brought me back to expedition and to camping with my family and just lots of childhood experiences. Um, just those sounds were huge memory triggers for me. It was, it was kind of like a walk down memory lane. Just, any, I mean, just any TV people. show or movie when they want to have something that, they use insects a lot. Um, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's because it, it you're absolutely it triggers a memory. You know, crickets being really quiet. You know, it must there must be no one out here. You know, so when there's something supposed to be a desolate area or just like in the middle of nowhere, you often hear the cricket, the sole cricket chirping. Yeah. Away. so <laughs> they're used a lot. They really have a social context. Uh, so, you know, I love that aspect of it because you know I think when you point it out, people start looking. It's like. What's your favorite movie? And I, you know, there may be some insects in there you never realized before that uh, people were, you know, because they elicit that 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 kind of idea. Because we do have childhood memories of being the same way, fireflies, mm -hmm. and bells, you know. This, so, you know, there's so much of that you realize. You know, I think we're all very visual, but many of other our senses, both smell and sound, um, we do have um, really strong uh, responses. Though sometimes of subliminal. Uh, that a lot of us, uh, you know, realize much later as we get older, and realize, oh, I, now and it just takes me back. There's this nostalgia for summer sights and smells and sounds. Someone just said that their swamp cicadas yeah. make you think of a hot summer day, right? Yeah. Mosquitoes, the same way, you know, mosquito buzzing. I mean, that again is yeah. also a very commonly used sound that you'll th see used. Um, movies and you know because it's everyone can relate to it everyone has been annoyed by that sound kept awake un unable to sleep because of that slow low mosquito that's in your tent <laughs> or your you know your room and you know i mean it's even made it into uh folklore and stories that mosquito buzzing sound so <laughs> it's definitely a part of us well, this has been incredibly interesting, and I loved all those sounds. I appreciate you sharing this uh, website with us. I think it's going to be one that people get to use a lot. I do know I have a, a an app that is a night sounds, you know, just white noise kind of app. And my the ones that I use are the they call them like the forest ones, but it's it's just insect sounds at night. So I don't even need the app anymore. I just play the uh, <laughs> play the website now. <laughs> I love music. I have so much, you know, I, was, I can think about three, three or four songs I like that have somewhere in them have some kind of insect sound, you know, again, yeah. maybe opening, just, you know, giving you a sense of still and then the music ramps up or so, like I said, they're, they're used so widely until you point out to people, they like, I never realized that. But now, you know, I'm watching, you know, when you're watching your next TV program outside, like notice what sounds they use. Mm. Uh, and I bet you'll find, without too much work, you'll find some insects that are put in there just to give it the context of being, you know, outdoors at night. That's really cool. Now, did you say that you were going to talk about the hashtag again? Oh, yeah. So let me, if you put back to my, let me switch again. I got to switch out here. Because you've got a great, um, Dr. Freel has been keeping an eye on everyone's hashtag and everyone's uh, submissions and has been kind of keeping an eye on it. He's got this really great um sticker giveaway that I think he's okay, got I'll information in here. Swap it out there. It's up there now. Yeah. So there's still time. We've Let's see. Today's the 23rd. So you've still got two more days to submit your bug theme artwork, memes, jokes, photos. Um, 
on your you can do it on your own social media channel uh, and just use the battle bug fest hashtag and it don't, i don't care if it's on facebook instagram twitter tiktok i check all of them um, and just share something again we want we like we love seeing feedback and this is a great way to do inspiring people um, and I'm going to pick the ones I like best, and I've got various stickers. We've got some of our Bama Bug Fest stickers featuring our giant stag beetle designed by Thomas Shahan, as well as some um, Black Lives Matter spider stickers that were designed by Dr. Um, Sebastian Echeverry, who was our spider specialist for some of our uh, segments that involve Black Widow and um, Spider-Man. So, again, uh, get those in. Um, you've only got a little more than 48 hours to do it. Uh, but I really appreciate it. I really like, you know, seeing how we plug. We've, we've got the art contest. That's already closed, and we saw some great artwork there. But uh, you can still continue to submit your stuff. We had a great alley. Have you? Did you see the TikTok video I shared that uh, Jada Elcott did? I reached out to her. She is someone I follow on TikTok, and she does something called Animal Facts. And it's gotten over a 1,000 likes. Um, hey! Uh, sent her some information about stag beetles. She's even wearing one of our Bama Bug Fest T-shirts, like a hat. <gasps> hat. And um, that's exciting. She, her enthusiasm is infectious. So if you haven't um, try to find it, I, I shared it. Uh, um, it's on TikTok under her Jada Elcott, uh, and maybe we can share that. But I think uh, it was shared on the UA Museum social media. Um, or if you if you Google Bama Bug Fest, uh, it will likely come up as a top hit. And, I'll uh, try to find uh, her channel and share it, share it in I'm, the comment section. I might be able to play it if we got a few times. I can try to pull it up. Yeah, if you've got, if you got, if we can do it through you your speakers. Back out here. Okay. Um, it, while he's pulling that up, I do want to remind everyone that separately from that sticker giveaway, we are also still accepting votes for the um, art contest, and um, the. Voting ends tomorrow at 5 p.m. sharp. So uh, you can visit our Alabama Museum of Natural History Facebook page, the Mildred Warner Westervelt Transportation Museum Facebook page, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library Facebook page. Um, all three of those sites have an ability or a chance for you to vote for your favorite art contest submission. Um, please make sure that you vote one of each age category. So there are four um, categories that you can vote from and they are all in photo galleries on those Facebook pages. So most likes will win and the wins uh, will be published and, and featured in our Museum Chronicle newsletter. Um, we're really excited about it and it ends tomorrow at 5 p.m. sharp. We have people who are counting votes um, at 5 p.m. to make sure that we have accurate numbers. So if you are interested in voting, if you know someone who's submitted and their art has been um, put up for a vote, uh, feel free to share that link with everyone you know. Um, while you're there, like the pages, subscribe to those pages. It's all really great organizations and they would love um, to have your support. So, you know, and they've put a ton of work into getting Bama Bug Fest off the ground and running. Um, so, or buzzing or flying or crawling or whatever is the best word for us for Bama Bug Fest. So make sure to throw them some love, um, throw them a like and a subscribe and and support all of our um organization's pages. Okay, almost there, Ellie. I'm trying to get the right. Okay, yeah, no problem. The other thing I want to mention too, right before we do this, uh, it's just another plug for today. We have at four o'clock today, we have this great video that's being posted about um, black lighting. So if you are interested in hearing some sounds, maybe even up close, you can learn how to put together a black light setup in your own backyard. Uh, John and Kendra Abbott are talking about how they set up theirs and then show you a way that you can set up a kind of like a starter pack one um, in your own backyard. And then tonight after our daily wrap up, which will be a little shorter this time, uh, we have our very first ever insect themed comedy show, which we're really excited about. So stick around for that. It'll be on at 730. You'll be able to find it wherever you're watching this video right now. You'll be able to see the comedy show there, too. Okay, yeah. All right, looks like we have your screen up. There so we like go. Said, Jada, so I'll, I'll go ahead and click this on her, but it's, you know, our logo features a giant stag beetle. So I reached out to Jada. She's a, she's someone I, I follow on social media because she studies sharks, and she's, she's a really good science communicator, but she started this a few months ago, and it's been kind of infectious. And uh, like I said, I, I reached out to her when I knew we were going to do this, and uh, she did this one specifically on our giant stag beetle. And friends are back. Marine facts suck with a giant stag beetle. Oh, here's one. Is it just me or do they look like a crab arm spread of legs? 
There are many different species of stag beetle, but the giant stag beetle is the largest in North America. They can get to be over two inches long, and it's important to mention that they can be either red or black. I like the red ones. They rely on damp, damp wood, so you can find them in mature forests. They actually prefer lowland forests for breeding, so don't go looking for them on a mountainside. Here's the wood as a baby beetle nursery. They lay their eggs in the logs. The larvae can thrive here for quite a long time before they turn into the big honking beetle boys that we all know and hopefully love. Quite honestly, I prefer the beetle form over the larva form, but we all gotta start somewhere, right? I know y'all wanna talk about the crazy face, so here's the deal. Yes, they've got giant jaws, but the gag is only the males do. See what I mean? The females have small mandibles, but the males have massive manly mandibles. The males have giant jaws so they can duel for the hand of a lady. So yeah, it's basically for mating competition. Kinda like deers with their antlers. Long live the king. <laughs> can they bite? I find this question to be quite strange because really anything with a mouth or jaws can bite you. So yes, they can pinch you, but they'll probably leave you alone as long as you don't bug them. See what I did there. And I felt the need to tell you, they can fly. So if you don't like flying insects, have fun with a two-inch-long flying beetle with antlers on its face. Personally, I think it's kind of cute. <laughs> That's so great. And I saw her shirt. Yeah, so I, I sent her some stickers in her shirt. And, you know, she's actually taking a, a class right now at Friday Harbor um, Labs. Uh, a fish course out, out off the coast of Seattle. So she managed to fit that in for us. So I really appreciate thank that. Thank you so much for that. Thank uh, you. Thank you. By far the most popular thing that we've shared on social media for uh, Bama Bug, because I know she's just infectious and other has a big following. So if, if you like that kind of thing, she does all kinds of animals. She even takes suggestions. So if you have a favorite animal, you can uh, hit her up with a suggestion. And uh, she does fishes, birds, mammals, insects, invertebrates, uh, does it all. Can you remind us of her name one more time, John? Yeah, her name is uh, Jada Elcott, or at least on Twitter, she's at Sophistication. <laughs> uh, and I think it's the same on, on TikTok. Is, um, Sophistication, okay. yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, thank you, Jada, if you're listening and watching this now. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, okay, well, I think that maybe wraps up for today. We have not had a ton of comments at the moment, but that doesn't mean we won't get them in later. Um, so if you watch this later and you have some memories involving summer sounds, um, like our friend Brooke did, uh, share them with us. We'd love to find out about it. And then don't forget to Share any of your great Bama Bug Fest content using hashtag Bama Bug Fest so that Dr. Friel can keep an eye on it and possibly send you some stickers. Um, and uh, make sure to stick around and hang out and uh, uh, be here for the four o'clock video that's posting. It's got some great information about how you can set up your own uh, black lighting setup at home so you can attract some insects to your uh, backyard and uh, stick around for the daily wrap up and comedy show tonight. I'm really excited about this comedy show. I think it's going to be great. I heard there's going to be some insect memes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't, I mean, you, you got some big shoes to fill, so we'll see how they do. You, you're the insect meme uh, winner so far. So we'll see, we'll see what they do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I would like to thank you again, John, for um, helping us out with this. And, and thank you all for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web today. So, you know, again, make sure to check us out the rest of the day. But then also our very last day, which is Saturday, July 25th. Uh, that day is our bug benefits day. So we'll have a day dedicated to how bugs are a part and fully integrated into our everyday lives. Um, and content always appears at 10 to four and the daily wrap up is at seven and all times are central standard time. So keep that in mind if you're not in the central standard time zone. Um, if you're not able to join us in for these live uh, presentations, you can always watch them later. They are archived on all of our social media channels and on our YouTube channels, which you can find information on how to get to all of those and where to see stuff at our website, bamabugfest.org. Um, and there's also a link to a handy resource guide that has some more information there. Um, we will make sure to link the, the website that you mentioned today, the Songs of Insects, and um, we'll get a link to that uh, TikTok from Jada as well on there. Um, and, um, you know, make sure that if you post anything, any art, any pictures, anything like that, that you use the hashtag Grandma Bug Fest so we can keep up with you and all of your great buggy fun. All right. Um, as always, we want to thank all of our collaborating partners for making this event possible. And we want to thank you, Dr. Friel, for sharing a little bit more of your expertise and some time with us. Um, we appreciate it and always enjoy your presentation. So thank you for doing that. And um, I guess we'll see you guys all uh, next time on Bama Bug Fest on the web. Hope everyone has a good day. Bye, folks.